Welcome, everyone, to the second webinar in the Soil Health and Organic Farming webinar series brought to you by the Organic Farming Research Foundation and the Organic. This webinar is about soil-friendly weed management and ecological approach. This is your host, Alice Formiga of eOrganic. eOrganic has many articles, videos, and webinars about organic farming and research, and you can find all of them on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. There's a link on your screen. We are recording this webinar, and it will be available within the next week on the eOrganic YouTube channel. The webinar will last between 45 minutes and an hour, and then we'll have 30 minutes for questions. We're expecting a large audience, but we will answer as many questions as we have time for after the webinar is over. So if you have a question, feel free to just type it into the Q&A box on your webinar screen, and um, you can do that at any time, and we'll answer the questions at the end. So today I'm very glad to welcome back Mark Schoenbeck and Diana Jerkins. Mark has worked for the last 31 years as a researcher, consultant, and educator about organic and sustainable agriculture, and he is the research program associate at the Organic Farming Research Foundation. He also works with the Virginia Association for Biological Farming. Diana Jerkins is the research program director of the Organic Farming Research Foundation, and she also has decades of experience in agricultural research, administration, and farming. So without any further delay, I'm going to hand over the screen to Diana. Okay, thank you, Alice. Uh, okay, it's slow, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I live on a farm, gentlemen and ladies, and uh, the internet connection sometimes is a problem. <laughs> so, um, Today is the second in a webinar series uh, on soil health and different topics. We did an intro, uh, as Alice said previously, and that has been recorded for your uh, perusal. This one is on soil health and weed management. Um, uh, it's specific for organic farmers and transitioning farmers, but most of the information also is very applicable to conventional farmers uh, as these are sound management practices. Um, this information is largely based uh, on a survey that we did in 2015 of organic farmers to ask the question of what, what research items, activities, do you have? 67% uh, cited weed management as the highest priority, second to that of soil health uh, overall. So uh, this, it's a, a major interest in organic farming, and we'll discuss why in a bit. Um, there's a dilemma as an organic farmer, perhaps, in controlling weeds and protecting soil health because uh, we do not have the ap uh, applicability of using um, conventional, <clears throat> excuse me, herbicides, synthetic herbicides. Um, and the reason for that, the philosophy behind that is to protect soil life and water resources and it also gives the advantage of being able to allow for mo more flexibility in your management style uh, with crop rotations. Um, as an organic producer, generally we mostly uh, we have gone to cultivation as the primary weed controller. Uh, unfortunately, this has some side effects uh, that it sometimes uh, causes additional weed germination. And it also, as you till the soil, burns up your soil organic matter, uh, inhibits or hurts the soil biota, and can, under certain conditions, increase crusting and erosion. Uh, our survey respondents also said that some of their priorities was integrating soil building practices with the National Organic Program's allowable weed control tactics. And also, uh, for small and large farmers, cost-effective strategies in weed control. And then also learning more about the effect of cultivation on soil health. Research topics also included other aspects such as cover crops rotation, and other practices on weeds, uh, the effects on soil microbes, uh, management of nutrients and soil conditions uh, that affect the activity of weeds or inhibits weeds, uh, breeding, uh, and we will have a webinar on breeding, uh, for crops that compete against weeds, and managing weeds and perennial crops, which many producers um, are growing. And a positive thing about weeds, uh, and there's been several, in fact, historic uh, books on weeds as indicators of soil health, soil conditions, uh, salinity, water, 
or drought conditions, etc., and soil types. And more and more crop and livestock integration is coming about. Uh, and so grazing used as a management tool, uh, they want to know research about that. Research other topics are just on specific um, uh, problem weeds. Here are a few of those. I know Johnson grass in the southeast and particularly bindweed when I was in California were my nemesis. Uh, and understanding the new weeds, their life cycles, and uh, control of weeds in wet and dry conditions depending on what part of the country you're in. Uh, so organic strategies for certain problem weeds, and we'll talk about a few of these uh, later in the presentation. So why do weeds happen? Uh, weed, I would tell my students, is defined as an unwanted plant in a given space. So weeds, however, are considered prime pioneer plants and they have a role in ecology. Pioneer plants spring up rapidly after fire, landslide, clear-cut tillage, and other disturbances that we do uh, in our management and in our trying to use the soil for production purposes. This leaves the soil exposed so that the ecological role of a, a pioneer plant or a weed uh, is to cover and protect that soil from erosion as soon as possible after disturbances. And in that process, it begins restoring soil organic matter like any, any plant would do, soil life, soil health, and it initiates the process uh, if the land was undisturbed into secession forest prairie or other communities. So without weeds, the world soil erosion problem actually would be much more severe. And sometimes it is the weeds that stand between soil disturbance and catastrophic erosion. But in production systems, that can also be a problem with their appearance. So humans make weeds. By definition, we define a plant as wanted or unwanted. Um, succession is the early stages uh, if would happen if we didn't do tillage. Um, and we create open bare soil or open niches. And also the export or import of exotic plants into different parts of the country has become problematic uh, as they have taken over. Um, as an example for a weed that may not be considered a weed in some circumstances, lamb quarters are often grown and eaten in greens as greens in northern India and may have been brought to the U.S. by European colonists for the same purpose. Purpose. Uh, I'd also say that dandelion from England was, was also quite the salad in its day. Johnson grass was imported for forage and erosion control as kudzu was, uh, while purple nut sedge was probably brought in by accident. So by definition, if you're an herbalist, some of these weeds may actually be a plant that you cultivate. The National Resource Conservation Service has defined uh, four areas uh, to improve weed control and soil health management. Um, they keep the soil covered as much as possible, which allows for, um, excuse me, which allows for uh, the plants not to be able to germinate. Maintaining living roots year round also helps in um, the exclusion of weeds and problematic um, invasive species. Tillage, as we've said before, is a primary way of, of uh, inorganic productions of controlling weeds. So physical, chemical, and biological soil, dis soil disturbances can affect the type and the amount of weeds. Weeds by nature are cover crops and in some situations they can provide real soil health benefits as we've noted before or at least prevent erosion. However, some invasive exotic plant species can release toxic substances to which the native soil microbiota or the plant community is not adapted to. Garlic mustard, for example, a three foot tall herbaceous weed from Europe can slowly but surely displace the new world hard work hardwood forest by inhibiting the mycorrhizal fungi on the tr that the trees depend on in their root system. Some of the first worst cropland and rangeland weeds such as purple nutsedge, Canadian thistle, spotted knapweed, 
also release intensely allopathic compounds which hurt crops and native plants, both by direct phototoxicity and indirectly by affecting soil microbial communities. Cropland weeds as pioneer weeds uh, adapt to frequently disturbed fertile soils. We're going to talk about the interaction between nutrition and weeds. Germination uh, is in response to clues for, from tillage. Knowing what makes weeds tick offers clues to effective management. In addition to, to a flash of daylight, tillage clues may include increased oxygen levels after cultivation breaks up the soil surface and soil aggregates, greater temperature fluctuations when the soil surface is exposed, and a flush of nitrate, nitrogen, or other soluble nutrients released when tillage stimulates decomp decomposition of organic matter. Reproduction of uh, weeds is very prolific, and we're going to talk a bit about that uh, later also. So preventing weed problems, that's, that's what we really want to know. What are some of the strategies? So several steps that we are going to recommend. Know your weeds on your farm. Uh, I, this is important because if you know uh, what the weeds are, what their life cycle are, what seasons they may come in, and their conditions for growth, and some of the germination clues, uh, this goes a long way to preventing or at least being able to eliminate them because you know about their conditions for growth. Knowing their strengths and weaknesses of the five or perhaps ten most abundant weeds on your farm will help identify the most effective preventive and control strategies. Newly emerged broadleaf weeds can be flamed in lieu of cultivation. However, grasses at the same stage have their growing point below ground and usually require a shallow cultivation. Purcell is so drought tolerant that it can easily reroot after being severed or uprooted. However, tall crops rapidly outcompete it in shading. So instead of cultivating, um, uh, tall crops such as corn can be used. Rhizomaceous perennials like purple nut sedge, quack grass, and bindweeds regrow profusely after tillage. However, they expend reserves to form the first few leaves and be weakened by cultivation at this stage. Close up the niche. Put the weeds out of work by growing cover crops. Cover crops is probably the primary uh, way of reducing weed competition or weed growth. Uh, more and more people are doing going to cover crops. Uh, extensive research has been done um, in the use of cover crops and as you can see depending on your location and your soil type and what you're growing there are a, a wide range of cover crops uh, that can be used and we again will be doing a specific uh, webinar on cover crops. Strip tillage and intercropping and mulching and relay planting are also other methods. Strip till through winter rye and then you mow the alleys the rye growth slows or dies back in the heat of the summer, so that does not become a weed in itself. In relay planting example from central Vermont, author Elliot Coleman sowed the clover between brassica rows when the latter was just getting established. After vegetable harvest, the clover is ready to grow and cover the ground. One point and I would like to mention is that there are perennial and annual clovers, so you need to understand their growth and the difference difference between use of those as a cover crop. Keep the weeds guessing. To deal with certain weeds that are getting out of control, you can modify the timing of field operations strategically. For example, the homestead garden in Floyd, Virginia, in which the photo was taken, once had terrible problems with a prolific summer annual weed that routinely emerged after May tillage to overwhelm most crops. Rotating the worst areas to garlic, planted and mulched in October and dug the following Ju July, or, in or into a year of red clover sharply reduced weed population. No-till termination of winter covers also curbed this weed, but encouraged another tough weed, hedge bindweed. One thing that I have found on my farm that even though you might have uh, a weed this year, 
next year you might have another major weed. So this is another reason to know that the common weeds on your farm or ranch and uh, their life cycle because weeds themselves will rotate as your management practices change. So rotation, varying the time of tillage and planting and harvest, different tillage methods will all vary in weed control tactics. Nothing beats weed like vigorous crops growing in healthy living soil to outcompete them. Anything that stresses a crop from weather extremes or soil health problems to poor quality seeds or non-optimum planting dates can result in more weed pressure. Ensuring sufficiently warm soil through good season extension practices as in the A picture in the beans and with uh, hoop houses or not rushing the planting date. For example, sweet potatoes set out several weeks after spring frost in the B picture helps heat loving crops beat the weeds because at that point they then will have the advantage of vigorous growth. Plant genetics play a role as varieties with tall structures such as corn, vigorous top growth and deep extensive root system are better equipped to both tolerate and suppress weeds. So combination of planting strategies when things are planted and the type of crop grown can definitely help in your weed control. Give the crops the edge over the weeds. Other management practices could involve your irrigation systems. Drip lines can be used to fertigate as well as bring moisture to your rows or beds using organic materials such as fish emulsion, seaweed extract, or compost tea in those lines. Subsurface drip, which is not shown here, also can water and feed established crops without watering weed seeds in the top couple of inches where they would be lying dormant, thereby reducing within row weeds as well. So you have two types of irrigation that uh, top and subsurface in the row and then under the, the plants themselves, leaving the between rows dry and not allowing weed seeds to germinate. Give the crops another edge over weeds. Comparative crop and weed responses shown in the diagram were documented in organic vegetable systems trials in Cornell University by Dr. Charles Moeller and his colleagues. This application showed that high available MP and K in different forms can actually enhance weed growth because they are such rigorous scavengers of nutrients. And optimum levels of fertility for your crops, not excessive or saturation rates, then will allow the crops to have maximum use of the nutrients and not encourage weed growth. Tilling in all legume cover crops can stimulate a flush of nitrogen responder weeds. So if you have, have tilled and have a high leguminous cover crop that uh, releases a lot of nitrogen, that also then is going to enhance weed growth or sprouting of those um, weed seeds. Note that the majority of crops form strong beneficial mycorrhizal associations. Exceptions to this are brassica, beet, spinach, and buckwheat. While many agricultural weeds, including pigweeds, lamb quarters, smart weeds, wild mustard, and nut sedges are not mycorrhizal, thus encouraging this fungi to have a symbiotic relationship with your crop in the root system can give crops another advantage over some weeds. To encourage these valuable fungi, avoid pea excesses, reduce soil disturbance, grow strongly microbes or crops like legumes, seal grains, allium, solanaceous crops in the rotation, and use mycorrhizal inoculates if needed to restore this component of the soil web if it is lacking. Strong nitrogen fixers like soybeans can gain an additional edge over nutrient responsive weeds when plant available soil nitrogen is low for them. Drawing down the weed seed bank is very important because weeds are very prolific in their seed production. Shallow cultivation less than an inch when weeds first emerge is a good way to get most weed control for the least soil disturbance. However, caution, if a large weed seed bank does exist, cultivation can stimulate a heavy new flux of weeds to emerge. 
necessitating more cultivation. A single pig, pig, pig weed escapee allowed to mature can deposit between 100 and 500,000 viable seeds. Drawing down the seed bank also can uh, creeping perennial weeds like nut sedge, whose emerging shoots can penetrate black plastic mulch, mulch pose the most challenging trade-offs for soil health and weed control. More research is needed to develop effective organic strategies to build soil health while bringing invasive perennials like purple and yellow sed nut sedges, Bermuda grass, and field bindweed under control. Preventive weed seed set can be determined the technique that you want to use, whether you want to mow it, cut it, pull it, or till it, depending again on the type, the structure of the weed and its growth habit. Um, perennials that have tubers or rhizomes are more difficult uh, because they're undergrowth, but as they are knocked out by cultivation or cutting, um, and rotating systems, then the tubers, underground tubers and rhizomes are going to be depleted. Also, avoid bringing or know where your mulch or your hay or your manure or compost come from and that it is weed free. Baiting the weeds, a stale seabed. Stale seabed technique deliberately rolls out the red carpet for weeds to trick the seed bank into germinating all at once. Where soil weed seed populations are high, two or three cycles of stale seed bed may be needed for adequate control. For creeping perennials like bindweed, nut sedge, and Canadian thistle, you may need to repeat shallow tillage when emerging sprouts have three leaves, thereby depleting underground rhizomes and tubers, as I just said. The farmer on the right has broadcast cover crop just below, before shallow tillage to begin rebuilding soil health after weed control. Let nature do the work. When a cover crop such as pearl millet or radish winter kills, it will leave residue on the surface until spring to let weed seed feeders like ground beetles reduce the weed seed bank. Delay tillage also improves soil health and can increase the yield of the next crop that is put in. Uh, one thing that we also do on my farm, and if you have chickens, is we let them in the field and they are wonderful seed uh, eaters also. Soil health and weed management. Mark is going to explain some management practices that can enhance both of these areas. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about some uh, practices that are uh, clearly shown in uh, research to both improve uh, soil health and uh, weed management. Uh, just keep the weed levels down. Uh, let's see if this works from here. Um, no, I think I'll let oh, you go ahead working. and do it. It's working. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of quotes from uh, research projects uh, that were conducted with uh, USDA organic funding. Uh, one is some research in the University of Maryland uh, on, on organic vegetable production and found that crop rotation is probably the most important integrated weed management tool and should be the cornerstone of the uh, weed management plan. And uh, there's some folks up in uh, a University of Minnesota uh, and they have been working with developing a risk management manual. In fact, it's been published, a risk management manual, manual for organic production, and a lot of focus on weed management. And uh, they've looked at different crop rotations over a number of years, and it, was, it became really clear that if you just rotate corn and soybeans, even if you put in a winter cover crop, um, you're going to both build up weeds and tend to run down soil uh, quality, soil organic matter, tilt, et cetera. Whereas uh, if you have a longer rotation, especially if you include a perennial crop in the rotation, uh, that will uh, enhance uh, the soil quality and will also reduce the weed populations. And we'll have a uh, next slide. We'll have a look at how this works. So here's an example of a, a quite a diversified vegetable rotation, and we have uh, four 
production crops, um, different plant families, and we have various cover crops representing the legume and grass families. Uh, so we have quite a diverse rotation. And yet, if you look at this, uh, the farmer will be tilling that field late in the spring of every year, and as a result, there are certain weeds, uh, examples of the pigweeds, lamb's quarters, uh, probably the ragweeds, crab grasses, uh, foxtails, gallon soga. Uh, a lot of you farmers probably recognize some of these as the, the most troublesome summer annual weeds. And their populations will tend to increase because there's a predictable disturbance every, part, every time at the same time of year in this rotation. And one way that this rotation could be improved is um, if you want to grow that set of four uh, vegetable crops in rotation, uh, you could see if you can t terminate some of those cover crops without tillage, like doing a roll crimp or with minimal tillage, uh, rather than uh, getting up there with the rotor tiller and working them in. Another trick that you can use, if you notice the cereal rise ahead of the cucumber, whereas crimson clover, which is a nitrogen fixer, is ahead of lima bean, another nitrogen fixer. So one strategy might say, okay, let's put that rye ahead of the lima bean. We know that the lima bean is quite a strong nitrogen fixer and uh, fairly self-sufficient for that nutrient. So uh, put the crimson clover ahead of the cucumber, which will use the um, nitrogen from the cover. Uh, and if possible, as I say, if uh, we do some roll crimping in a couple of those, uh, that could help. Um, so let's look at the next example of a crop rotation. A uh, similar level of diversity. We have three vegetable crops and one cereal grain grown to harvest, and then various legume and cereal cover crops. And you can see that the timing of the tillage, the soil disturbances, are going to be different in terms of what, what time of year. The red clover, you'll be turning that in fairly early in the spring, plant the potatoes. Uh, there's unavoidable soil disturbance in taking the potatoes out, and probably just immediately after that, plant the fall cover. Um, and that's a cover that does do well in the no-till no roll crimp uh, application, um, as does butternut squash, if it, especially if it's transplanted. And uh, then at the end of that crop, you could uh, do some tillage ahead of the uh, spring lettuce, and that can be followed by the winter cereal grain. And you might be able to just direct drill that fall grain um, without tillage, depending upon how much residue and how much weed pressure you have after the lettuce. Uh, another trick to, to do, um, uh, another thing about this rotation is the red clover grows for a full year and a half. It's underseeded into the grain and is allowed to grow for a full season and then turned under ahead of the potatoes. That creates that longer um, interval when uh, the soil is undisturbed and the ground beetles and other weed seed consumers have um, uninterrupted access and undisturbed environment. So that, uh, during that time, the populations of annual weed seeds tend to decrease considerably. Now, it is true that uh, perennial weeds will tend to come in eventually, like if that was alfalfa and you grew it for three years or something, you'll start to get some of the invasive perennials coming in. And that is where, again, a strategic tillage uh, will disrupt their life cycles. Okay, uh, a few tips on cover cropping for effective weed control. Uh, the, the name of the game here is to get the ground covered as quickly as possible. If your number one purpose for the cover crop is to keep the weeds down, is you want a cover crop that's going to jump up out of the ground and cover it before uh, weeds can emerge and get full sunlight. Uh, buckwheat is probably the best. That's a buckwheat crop that was sown at about 100 pounds to the acre, and within 14 days it pretty much closed the canopy. And another example is that cowpea. Now, that was actually that one, the cowpea, 37 days after planting. The interesting thing about that is I made a, a significant mistake in that particular field trial. I made a seedbed, and I walked away, and five days later, the seedbed still looked perfect. And I went out there with my little hand-pushed seeder to do these small pots, basically simulating a direct drilling right into the seedbed. Well, the weeds had been germinating for five days, and the next day they all came up, and the cover crops came up several days later. And the interesting thing to me is I compared several summer legumes, soybeans, cowpea, sun hemp, and several summer grasses, sorghum sedan, and various uh, types of millet. And all of the cover crops were disappointingly weedy, except the cowpea, because it formed that canopy so quick that the germinating weed seedlings never really saw full sun. 
So when you are looking for a multifunctional cover crop, like you want to fix nitrogen and protect the soil and um, keep the weeds down, make sure that one of the species in the mix is going to cover the ground quickly. And it's a balancing act because you don't want it to cover it so quickly that it completely suppresses your other cover crops and you lose the uh, function. But one thing you can do, for example, if you're sowing at the end of summer and you do want some of the cover crop to overwinter and grow in the spring, give you biomass and nitrogen, you can include a quick uh, growing non-winter hardy cover crop. Now that depends on your hardiness zone. If you're up in the upper Midwest, then oats and Austrian peas and uh, buckwheat would all die out, whereas if you're in the deep south, only the buckwheat would be susceptible to the light frost we have in, in that part of the country. But anyway, include one of those fast recovering crops. A radish is another good one, tillage radish. It really covers the, the ground quickly. And uh, when it gets to about 15 degrees, if you expect your winter to get colder than that, it will eventually die out. And then the slightly slower growing but hardier crops will then take over. Um, the other thing that's really important in, in using cover crops for weed management is to really give them optimal conditions. Make sure you plant them timely. A late planted cover crop is less likely to fight weeds. If you're a little bit late, like a week or so later than your, your optimum planting date for that particular cover, and you don't have another cover crop that you could put there instead, you can just increase the seeding rate a little bit uh, to compensate for the slightly late planting. Um, and another thing is adequate fertility and moisture. Now, cover crops are, are less fussy about fertility, about seed bed, and a lot of them are fairly drought tolerant. But if you have really dry soil conditions, um, especially when you're uh, farming at a relatively small scale, like you have a vegetable market garden, um, it really can make sense to just put one sprinkle irrigation on your cover crop just to get it up. If you're you're planting, it's the right planting date, but there's no rain in the forecast for the next two weeks. You want to get that cover crop up. Okay. And this is a very interesting experiment I did many years ago when I was at the New Alchemy Institute on Cape Cod. Uh, it's a nonprofit that is no longer uh, functioning. Uh, it did close in the 1990s. Uh, but this is in the late 1980s. We were, this is one of the earliest organic no-till experiments. We grew various uh, cover crops like rye, hairy vetch, crimson clover, and mixtures of the rye and one or, one or the other of the legumes. So on the left, you see a nice thick stand of rye and hairy vetch. And what you see is, a, is the niche is more thoroughly occupied. The, the, the photo looks dark, and it's because really, indeed, down there in the canopy, it is quite dark. There's, the rye is six feet tall, and the vetch is... Um, more broadleaf, and, it, and it's very dense, and it's, it's shading the ground very thoroughly. Neither crop alone would give you nearly that much shade and weed suppression. The vetch would uh, just be uh, sprawling on the ground rather than able to climb. Um, so when we cut those different cover crops down, the rye and vetch, you see there was a broccoli, uh, and I just did this uh, just did it with, with, with hand, hand tools with a sickle, cut it down and, and planted this little plot with broccoli. You can see there's practically no weeds. There's a few strands of quack grass. And uh, which just tells you that's a perennial. It's hard to suppress with any form of mulch. But a lot of the annual weeds are just uh, completely absent. Now, we look at what you happen with just the rye, and a weed called, an annual weed called horseweed, uh, Coniza canadensis, um, and some of the grasses were able to establish. And between the fact that the rye tied up nitrogen and it also didn't shade the ground as thoroughly, the weeds are ahead of the broccoli. The broccoli is uh, nitrogen stressed and the weeds are getting the upper hand. On the lower left, uh, with vetch alone, um, again, we didn't have quite as thorough weed suppression. And also because the vetch is so rich in nitrogen, we have lush broccoli, but the pigweed is right there with it. And it's like um, really responding to that nitrogen. Uh, so that's an example where you have complementary architecture and also complementary uh, soil nutrient dynamics that allow uh, this combination to actually suppress weeds more effectively than either one alone. Now, not all studies on uh, cover crop mixtures have shown an advantage in weed suppression over one uh, species alone. Two reasons for this, that the single species used for comparison is one of the ace weed fighters, such as buckwheat or, or uh, tillage radish. Um, it's kind of hard to beat that because they are very dense canopy. 
And it's also because very often if you don't get the ratio just right and the mixture, you will have one cover crop um, out competing the other and you have in effect uh, a single species uh, stand. Okay, here's an example of how uh, soil health will favor crops over weeds. Um, a couple of examples. A lot of the very fine seeded weeds actually germinate better when there is some surface compaction. When you have a loose, crumbly, open surface structure, a very good crumb structure, and you haven't tilled it excessively, hasn't been hit by beating rains, um, there's not as much seed soil contact with those tiny seeds, so they're not as likely to pop up. And you can see in the lower right-hand picture there that the pigweeds are emerging in the footprints. That's a sandy loam soil out in the coastal region of Virginia, all of the loamy sand, very, very uh, coarse textured soil. Um, very loose grain, but when uh, somebody walked down there, down the edge of the bed, their footprints were outlined by the pigweed. And then we look at the upper right, we see a, a yellow nut sedge, which is one of the right, um, underground spreading invasive uh, perennial weeds. It forms a little tubers, which are called the nuts. Um, now in this field, in the foreground is the low end of the field where the soil was a little wetter and a little more compacted, and there the nut sedge is overwhelming the crop, whereas further back in the field where the drainage is better, there is nut sedge, but it's not nearly as heavy. And these are examples of weeds responding to non-optimum soil physical conditions and overall soil health. As you build the soil organic matter and overall soil biological activity, um, you will give the crop the edge over the weeds in a number of different ways. Um, also, when the soil is healthy, the crops don't require as much soluble inputs of nitrogen and other nutrients so that uh, they are then able uh, to get that uh, little bit of an edge on the weeds just by the uh, uh, different nutrient responses. And also, healthy soils grow healthy crops, and healthy crops are both more tolerant of the weeds and also more uh, able to compete directly with them. Okay, now this is over on, uh, this is an, not an area of my expertise directly, but I've done enough reading to understand how management intensive rotational grazing can really get the handle on weeds. Uh, and here's a pasture weed is simply something that cows don't like. You ask a cow, uh, lambs quarters and smooth pigweed and palmer amaranth are not weeds. They are the best. They're some of the best food. They love that, have a little bit of those very rich, nutritious broadleaves mixed in with their grasses. But you throw the spiny amber and they say, wait a minute, this stuff is prickly. It might taste good, but it's really prickly. I don't want to eat this stuff. So what will happen is in pastures, spiny amaranth will become a weed, whereas this close relative smooth pigweed will continue to, you know, just come up and get eaten down. So the way to get around this is instead of letting your, your 40 cows roam over the entire back 40 all year saying, well, one animal unit per acre, good soil, good pasture should be fine, what happens is they go around the graze preferentially and they eat down their favorite stuff. They eat down the most desirable plants over and over. And just the fact that everything is eaten down periodically, very frequently, you don't have the same graze and recover cycle that you do with management intensive grazing. You take that back 40 and divide it into 40 paddocks, and you run the cows in each paddock for a day or two, then each little section will experience a day or two of intense grazing, trampling, and a deposit of manure and urine, and, and so there's a shock and then it's been fed and then everything grows back evenly and the um, spiny amaranth and other undesirable pasture weeds do not get the uh, such an advantage because you've en enhanced the growth of the desirable plants to actually have that whole 40-day uh, period to recover. Okay, there are a few, I'd say, pitfalls here. I'd say there are a few places where you can have a trade-off between um, soil health optimizing practices and weed management. Um, one example is organic no-till. Um, organic no-till is a general term for a rotational no-till system since continuous no-till is not really feasible at all in organic annual cropping rotations. But if, you, if you're looking at uh, a rotational no-till situation, you're growing a cover crop until late flowering, 
or very early uh, seed set, but you don't want those seeds to mature like, like um, a milk stage or uh, in the uh, grains. What you want to do is you roll crimp it or mow it very close to the ground with a flail mower and then plant through the residue. The roll crimper works best because it orients the residues all in the same direction and then no-till planters have been designed that slice through it quite nicely and uh, put the uh, transplants or the large seeds in. However, this works only when everything's going in your favor. Like you don't have an untimely period of very wet or very dry weather that uh, that um, interrupts uh, timely planting. Um, another thing that you want to be careful is you don't want to try organic no-till too soon after breaking a sod, whether it's a gra uh, an alfalfa sod that was as part of your rotation or you're just breaking a pasture area and turning it into cropland. Because what will happen is those perennials will come right up through the mulch. Another thing is if your general weed seed bank is large, uh, if you haven't had good weed control, you don't want to go straight into organic no-till because uh, the few annual weeds will get through, and they'll thrive just as well as your crop will in that in that uh, very soil health enhancing environment. There's another thing that happens in organic no-till. It's particularly challenging for those in the north, and that is that you have cooler soil, and uh, that slows down nitrogen mineralization. It also slows down germination itself. Um, you also have to have uh, the equipment set just right uh, so that you have good seed soil contact. Any of these can delay the establishment of the crop or give you a spotty stand, and that can really sharply reduce your yields. Another caution with cover crops is there are some cover crops that can turn around and become weeds if they're allowed to set seed. Japanese millet, uh, I've heard some farmers have a real problem with that, and the, and the difficulty with Japanese millet is it matures seed quite quickly, and unlike pearl millet and uh, the winter cereal grains, you can't reliably kill it by mowing or roll crimping at uh, the beginning of seed set. So it'll come back and it'll form a bunch of seeds, and it can be a real headache. Buckwheat is well known to self-seed, and when it occurs in low populations, it's not that bad a problem. It's not a really aggressive weed, and it is a beneficial habitat plant. You don't want, though, you don't want a full cover crop of buckwheat when you're going to grow something else, so you want to be careful of that one. Cereal grains can self-seed. I've seen vetches and crimson clover do the same. Um, hairy vetch can be a really serious problem because it forms hard seed that will persist until in, uh, two or three seasons. And if you're trying to grow winter cereal grains, that is a major weed. You may not want even one in your rotation. You want to look at crimson clover or Austrian field peas, neither of which has that serious problem. Another caution was organic inputs. Compost is a great amendment. Uh, it's valuable. You have to be conscious, though, that it is often uh, quite rich in nutrients, uh, especially phosphorus. Like this is a compost that uh, was made by a company here in Virginia. Uh, unfortunately, they're out of business now because they made a very good compost from food waste and yard waste. And they had a high analysis of 1.3% nitrogen, 1% phosphate, 1% potash. And if you have soils that are low in nutrients, it's a great way to build it up. But once you have adequate levels, putting on that kind of rich compost or uh, even more so putting on uh, manure, you can actually build up uh, more uh you can actually stimulate more weed growth than you stimulate crop growth. The interesting thing in that, that Cornell study that was uh, shown earlier, uh, where weeds continue to respond to increasing rates of chicken litter uh, compost past the level at which corn and uh, uh, kale showed a uh, saturation, they found that the compost stimulated more weed growth than providing the nitrogen, the equivalent amount of nitrogen and or potassium from other organic permissible sources. So there was something about the total NPK and or other aspects of the compost that at those high rates was giving that, um, uh, really stimulating the weeds. Um, another thing is uh, you want to be watched for organic inputs that may be a direct source of new weed seeds. Um, manure that's raw or aged or cool composted. Any compost that did not heat above 440 degrees for about a week may contain weed seed. Uh, mulch hay or straw is also a common source, either the hay grasses themselves or sometimes just uh, more noxious weeds like um, uh, Canadian thistle. Um, and then crop seed is occasionally contaminated with weed seeds, and you want to uh, check to make sure it's certified free of the worst weeds and very low in weeds altogether.
Okay. So a couple of examples of integrated weed management, taking all these considerations into account, how to get the most weed control with the least damage to the soil. That's the name of the game. First thing is cultivating strategically. And uh, mainly what you want to do is you get in there when the weeds are small, anywhere between the white thread stage where you barely see them at all unless you stir the soil surface and see a little white threads an inch or two long. That's the weed root coming out of the seed and it's about to pop up or when the weeds are up to about one inch, because then all you need to do is to disturb the soil very shallowly. You do this at the beginning of a nice, hot, dry day, and all you do is just, just enough to get that weed uprooted, and it'll fry by the end of the day, and you have caused very minimal soil disturbance. Another thing is by stirring that shallowly, you don't cause as many new weed seeds to germinate as if you went a little deeper. Like if you're going down two or three inches when you need to only go down a half an inch, then you're exposing unnecessarily millions more seeds per acre to that light flash and up they'll come. Now, if you're in a minimum till or no-till system, there are high residue cultivators that can do the job without burying all the residues. Um, and then uh, there's many, many weed uh, management uh, tools out there that you can put on your tractor. And the best one uh, depends on your crop stage of growth, what species of weeds you have, what size the weeds are, and your soil conditions. There's a whole bunch of demos, uh, video demos at the Extension website. Um, I immediately found this as an example, and unfortunately, I think I read somewhere just in the last couple of days that it's no longer uh, commercially available, which I don't understand. It's called a wiggle weeder. And the really neat thing about it, you can see how after the weeder has disturbed the soil, knocked out the tiny weeds, left the crop intact, the soil crumbs. Here, the soil crumbs are also still intact. They haven't been pulverized. And not only does that save soil uh, quality, but you haven't done that pulverizing and then compacting like with the next rainfall. If it had been pulverized, it would pack down and more weeds would come up like with the pigweed we saw earlier. So I was really impressed with that tool, and I, um, I hope that either it is indeed still available or that there are other tools that have the same um, uh, properties or think uh, capacity. Um, there are ways you can do you can manage weeds without other than uh, cultivating, like uh, mowing between the rows in an established crop. Uh, recently, I learned that the University of Missouri, uh, on one of the ORI funded grants, is has developed a four row inter row mower. So when you're going through an established crop and you want to keep the weeds from getting out of hand and setting a bunch of seed. You can mow between the rows rather than either cultivating or resorting to spraying. Uh, flame weeding is an excellent <coughs> tool, especially for small broadleaf weeds. Uh, I can go ahead and start this uh, video here. Um, other examples are directed hot water or steam. University of Missouri is looking at that, and it's safer, um, especially with mulch, than flaming. Uh, mulching, either organic or... Um, uh, wait a minute. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I did something there or something. Anyway, um, so uh, various mulches have different uh, capacities to, to manage weeds, uh, to suppress weeds, organic mulches. Uh, they aren't uh, are slam dunk because a lot of perennial weeds will get through them. Plastic is more effective, but it's not as beneficial to soil health. Um, grazing in rotation is a good way to, to manage some weeds. Uh, weed or grease. Geese have been effective on uh, grasses, which uh, young grasses, which uh, flame weeding doesn't get as well. Uh, the National Organic Program does allow a number of herbicides based on vinegar, fatty acids, or essential oils, or combinations thereof. Those are uh, good um, for, as a supplemental measure, they're not effective as a standalone field uh, weed management tool. Uh, the upside is they are less toxic than a lot of the uh, chemical herbicides that uh, are not allowed under organic. So let's have a quick look at this video. We can look at this for a moment. Uh, my, fir my first experience, practical experience with flaming was, uh, was this little device here. The idea is, is that I can, I can apply flame to, to a bed, uh, I mean to, a, to, a, to anything, to a row. What I do is I go over, <clears throat> I actually go over the rows that, that are planted just before the seeds come up. 
And this thing is very useful for... Can people uh, hear what he's saying? For no, I don't think so, but the audio okay. text okay. is here in case people want to go to this afterwards. You put the link on your slides. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, here we can see how he's flaming uh, with the backpack flame or flaming around. The, I think it's a crop that hasn't emerged yet, and he's just taking the weeds out of the seed row. Yeah. Okay, I think we probably can okay. go on. All right. Let me go back to the PowerPoint there. Okay. So here's an example of a problem weed that um, – actually has a couple of weak points that can be exploited. Like all of these invasive perennials, if you allow it to come up just about to a few leaves, like uh, the weeds on the left, uh, and then till it again, you take it down. But another thing about Canada thistle is that it puts a lot of its energy into the top growth as it gets tall and just up to the point of flowering. You don't want it to flower because then it starts setting seeds, and it'll spread both by seed and by underground uh, creeping roots. Um, it's a major problem in organic uh, reduced till grain rotations. Uh, the interesting thing is it's uh, sorghum Sudan grass and uh, Sudan grass itself are very effective because you plant the cover crop in the late spring and, you know, till it up, and I'll chop up the, the uh, a Canadian thistle, but it won't uh, stop it from growing back, but you have the um, cover crop growing with it. And you grow until the cover crop is about three to five feet tall, and the um, ca uh, Canada thistle has a, a, maybe a dozen leaves and it's got a tall stem. Then you cut it all back, and what happens is the sorghum sudan responds to that mowing with very vigorous regrowth, and uh, the root system becomes even deeper and denser, and it gives off an allelopathic substance that um, the Canada thistle is quite sensitive to. And simply this mow and grow through a couple of cycles through the summer has reduced Canada thistle uh, populations by as much as 98% the following year compared to other strategies that involve buckwheat and other um, uh, competitive cover crops. Another thing about Canada thistle is if you do have alfalfa or other forages in the rotation and you actually cut those uh, for hay or, or uh, graze them, um, Actually, probably cutting is better. I don't think the uh, uh, thistle is that palatable. So if you if you mow it for hay, uh, that repeated mowing will weaken the the uh, thistle and uh, give the uh, the forage, the perennial forage, the edge on it. And then when you rotate back into annuals, uh, the thistle populations are greatly reduced. So if you have a thistle problem, you could develop a rotation strategy that includes both the perennial sod and at some point in the annual cropping sequence of sorghum sudan cover crop. Another example is giant ragweed. Uh, this emerged as a major problem in, a, in an organic uh, grain forage uh, production study is, uh, by, uh, at Ohio State University. One of their farmers, uh, farmer cooperators, Ed Snavely, had this idea of adding a fifth year to an already fairly diverse four-year rotation. And that fifth year um, is between the corn and the soybeans. It consists of um, early season stale seed bed, a little bit of cultivated fowl, followed by um, a buckwheat crop, which can either be grown as a green manure or grown for grain. And that variation in the sequence of events was just sufficient to disrupt the life cycle of giant ragweed, so it turned it from a really major problem in soybeans into a much more manageable one. And he has subsequently uh, expanded to a seven-year grain and forage rotation and gotten the, uh, um, the populations of giant ragweed and other uh, weeds uh, down even further. That was an example of a very interesting farmer innovation uh, in the context of a, a, a research project. Now, on a small scale, if you're looking at uh, a, a market garden, a uh, couple of acres of vegetables, uh, one thing you can do to enhance the efficacy of organic minimum till is right after flail mowing or roll crimping of a cover crop such as rye and hairy vetch, lay um, an opaque tarp, uh, the uh, black uh, weed mat or uh, landscape fabric is, is a really good possibility because it breathes, it allows air and water exchange, it allows uh, moisture in, but it pretty much blocks light and it's uh, strong enough to block just about all weeds. 
Just leave that there for a couple of weeks, maybe up to four weeks, and that not only ensures a full termination of the cover crop so you don't get rye regrowth uh, and such, but it'll also take out a lot of the weeds and then plant the tomatoes. Or as shown in the picture, you can actually leave the, the, uh, the weed mat in place and plant the tomatoes through the holes. Uh, another farmer that I've worked with here in southwest Virginia, Anthony Flacavento, also uh, used a clear plastic to actually solarize a recently mowed cover crop. In this case, it was pearl millet and uh, uh, cowpea late summer. And he only needed a couple of days because solarization is very intense, gets the soil very hot. Um, a couple of days affected a full cover crop kill and then an excellent broccoli crop with very few weeds. Uh, orchards and vineyards uh, present a little different situation, a little different set of weed management challenges. Uh, once you have orchard trees or uh, vines uh, or other perennial fruit well established, you can actually maintain uh, a sod at least between the rows. Um, but at least during the early stages of establishment, you have to be sure there's no competition by either weeds or cover crops close up to your young uh, planting stock. And uh, there was another project uh, and Pacific Northwest it was either University of Washington or Oregon State. But one of the farmers had this idea of, of laying the weed mat in a way that it's a zipper arrangement so that it overlaps in the center of the row, but it's still easy to pull back in order to apply compost and other amendments. And then you can put it back in place. So you maintain that weed control and with the, um, the weed mat allowing uh, moisture and air exchange, uh, you can maintain soil health that way while you're getting your young crop established without um, without a lot of weed competition. And there have been numerous studies, both in the United States and abroad, that showed that orchards that are managed with any kind of bare fallow, whether it's uh, herbicide in a conventional system or repeated tillage in an organic system, uh, soil health really suffers. Um, you can burn up half the organic matter. Um, if you use weed mat or other uh, applied mulches, applied organic mulches, you're much better off uh, but the best really is, in the long term, is to having a living cover, uh, and or at least living cover between your rows of uh, crop and planting stock. And then what you can do is uh, mow that periodically and blow the material into the row. Uh, so that's uh, a long-term approach that works once the uh, the crop is established. Okay, I think that's it. Questions? Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Mark and Diana. Mm -hmm. Um, I know, Mark, you were talking about um, compost, and um, mm -hmm. so a listener was asking, with regards to avoiding the import of new weed seed, are there any tests or standards typically applied to manure or compost that a farm importer can ask the producer to conform to? I don't know if there are any standards on uh, weed content. Uh, I mean, when you buy a commercial product, you know, like a compost, um, I believe you can you can ask if they have done that. Uh, I mean, one of the simplest things to do is just to put some of the material in a flat, maybe mix it with, um, you know, a soilless medium that you know is free of weed seeds, and you see what comes up and see how much it com uh, how much comes up and what, what species. And one thing I would say is that if it's a heat-treated poultry litter product, such as Harmony and uh, Purdue and uh, there's several other brands, you know, like uh, usually a 524 analysis, something like that, because of the intense heat with which they're treated, those will be essentially weed-free. Uh, I do not know the answer to the question as to whether other compost providers um, have any standards or have any standard uh, testing procedures that they can use. Okay, thanks. Um, let's mm -hmm. see. Some studies show that cover crops lead to lower cash crop yields um, subsequently. I think you showed one example where rye or vetch alone did not help the broccoli as much as the mix of rye plus vetch. Um, so the question is, how does one ensure that the cover crops boost cash crop yields? That's a really good question, and uh, that is why cover crops can be one of those areas where you, you do run into some soil health uh, weed management trade-off. Uh, there are so many factors that go into whether uh, cover crop is going to affect yield and which way. Um, 
I would say this much, that in a series of annual surveys, uh, the USDA Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program, or SERI program, a survey one to 2,000 farmers every year, organic and non-organic, about cover crop usage, and they have estimated that on the whole, there is a small but significant tendency towards improved yield after cover crops. And this becomes more pronounced when you've used the cover crop several years in a row and thereby built up soil health. And it also is most pronounced in drought years where the cover crop uh, effects on uh, soil health and deep moisture storage uh, are most important. So, um, and there are, I mean, it's just specific things you want to pay attention to. If you're going to grow a heavy uh, nitrogen feeder, like corn, you don't want to proceed it with rye because that's going to tie up the nitrogen. I mean, like uh, also, as you saw in the example, the brassica, the broccoli after the rye was quite nitrogen deficient. Now, if I planted soybean or edamame soybean, let's say, for you know a horticultural crop after that same rolled down rye, it probably would have done very well because it's a strong nitrogen fixer. Okay. Um, I know you mentioned millet on one of the slides as sometimes becoming a uh, problem weed. So how long does it say, take for seed set in the millet? I know it was a particular type of millet. Okay. That, you that is Japanese millet, which is a kind of cloa, and it's closely related to barnyard grass. It's about 50 days after planting, it'll head. And as soon as you see those heads, you want to terminate that cover crop. And if you mow it, you keep an eye out because it may head out. It may just come up with a little short sauce and head again very quickly. Um, pearl millet is, is at the opposite extreme. It'll head in about 75 days. And many of the pearl millet uh, varieties used for cover crops are actually male sterile grazing hybrids. So they have essentially zero weed uh, risk. And the neat thing about pearl millet is if you mow it or roll it, bef uh, if you mow it before it heads out, it will do a lot like the sorghum sudan. It'll send its roots even deeper and grow back and give you more biomass. Whereas if you mow it after heading or roll it after heading, uh, it'll terminate fairly easily. A third kind of millet is foxtail millet. It'll head out at about 60 days. Um, although it's very closely related to the foxtail weeds and it looks a lot like them, uh, their seeds just don't tend to last over the winter. They tend to rot away. So uh, they do have a very low weed potential. Uh, and they are also easily managed, terminated by uh, mowing or rolling right after uh, they head out. Okay. Um, what the organic weed well for in perennial crops with drip irrigation? Um, this person is putting in blueberries and needs to get the grasses down long enough to spread wood mulch. Um, he has some perennial weeds like wild rose and rubrus. How to manage those in blueberries? I would say. While the crop was establishing, I would perhaps use that weed mat with the overlapping arrangements so that you can easily pull back the weed mat to feed the soil and feed the crop. Uh, drip irrigation under the mat will, will, of course, allow you to make sure you have enough moisture and you can do drip fertigation to provide some of the nutrient needs. Um, you know, definitely get the soil amended, built up with cover crops and a little bit of compost uh, according to, uh, to the uh, soil test. Uh, before you plant, uh, those are tough weeds. Perennials in perennials, it, it is a tough problem. But I think that that uh, the weed mat is effective against most of them. Okay, um, we have also a comment that for this person, silage tarps work better than landscape fabric. Okay, well that's very interesting. I've heard some people using the silage tarps, and in fact, uh, um, Jean Martin Fortier, who wrote. Uh, a book about uh, market scale gardening in Quebec, uh, which is a very short growing season, and he's making a living on an acre and a half. He uses the silage tarps a lot, as a, and he calls it all cultation. Basically, just putting the soil in the dark for a period of time and just smothering out the weeds that way. Uh, I would say what works is great, and if it's old silage tarps and you're reusing something that would have gone to the landfill, that's all the better. Okay, um, here's another comment, and that is that um, diversity, we were talking about livestock, and um, this person says that diversity in livestock species also helps with weed control in pastures. That's absolutely true. I saw an excellent example of that once in uh, East Tennessee. Uh, she was running sheep with her cattle, and just doing that, we have a, a native uh, shrubby tree called juniper, uh, 
and it's thought to be a terrible pasture wheat, but you get sheep mixed in with the cows, and now they, they like juniper, and they eat it down so it doesn't become dominant. Uh, also, also the sheep are pretty good on, on uh, multi-flora rows. So that's an excellent point. Thank you. Um, can you address any changes that could be made when you have significant invasive numbers of animals such as deer or Canada geese? <laughs> uh, deer, if you're in a rural area and uh, you have careful and trained hunters, I'd harvest them. <laughs> or uh, very high fencing. Another thing that works for deer is if you have two fences that are about three feet apart, two wires, and you, you put little little tags on them to just, like, uh, flag them. Or you can electrify one of them. But if you have two wires that are about three feet apart uh, in distance, uh, deer have very poor uh, depth perception, and when they see the double wire, they get paranoid and they're less, less likely to jump it. Um, and uh, Canada geese, I do not have any ideas. Do you, um, Diana? Um. No, uh, mm. we have geese, but they tend to go to the pond and are happy, happy visitors there. I will say we we have definite deer problem, uh, and so we have eight nine foot uh, fencing all around the vegetable production area. <clears throat> and um, some of my hunters uh, who hunt in the winter time, in the summer, uh, if if it becomes a problem, uh, you can get a permit. And uh, I thought this was um, an antidote and uh, rather curious, but one of my hunters said, if, if you have a problem and you capture or uh, uh, take one deer uh, and the rest learn about that for some reason. And it, it sounds funny, but they really do. You don't have to, to cultivate or cull the deer throughout the whole season. It's like they're saying, okay, let's not go there, Joe, because they're they're going to get us. <laughs> okay, um, we're getting a couple questions about um, field bindweed. Um, the first one is, have you tried any biocontrols for uh, bindweed? And uh, the second one is, do you have any ideas for bindweed reduction in Northern Plains organic clay loam soil field currently planted in oats. So I don't know mm. how specific you can get here, but uh, we have bindweed problems. So. I'm aware that that is one of the top challenges, especially in uh, dryland organic production, you know, northern Great Plains. Being a, a Virginia resident used to 40 inches of rain a year, uh, I do not have enough direct experience to really give much guidance on that. Uh, I consider that a very important cutting-edge research topic. I know there have been some studies. I know there have been some biocontrols that have shown some promise. Um, Diana, can you add any more to that? Uh, when I was in California, bindweed was a major problem uh, there. Um, and we did research, uh, to uh, tillage research, uh, and just let the ground stay fallow. But it, <clears throat> you can't just uh, you can't just let it go fallow in the till once or twice because the the root structure or the the rhizomes and the bindweed just take over. It's like you're incre multiplying them by tillage. Uh, but if you do it over a long period of time. Uh, that seemed, and this was over a two-year period, that seemed, and, and multiple tillages, just uh, very frequently as soon as they started uh, coming up, uh, did reduce the population. But that was on a vegetable production scale. So in grains, I know it is, is a tremendous problem, and the major problem is taking out uh, fields for production for a long period of time is an economic problem. Uh, but it, it can work if you have a long enough period of, of um, layby. That is a really challenging situation because you're really going to be burning up organic matter. It's, the, the soil health cost of something like that uh, would probably be considerable unless you found a way to grow a very aggressive, fast-growing uh, cover crop between successive tillages. Have, have you tried that, Diana? Uh, no, they were they were just trying uh, just tillage. Uh, in this particular experiment, but you're right. You uh, and then in those areas with the cover crops, you have the added difficulty of uh, lack of moisture. Um, ah. So it's 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 uh, it's a research question. We should we should make sure that we um, have that researched. 
Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, let's see. This person just wants to know more about landscape cloth and whether it's allowed in organic production. I'm pretty sure it is. I mean, it is a synthetic material, but just like black plastic, as long as you pick it up when it's when it's served its purpose and doesn't become uh, litter in the soil, it is it is permissible as far as I know. Okay. Um, what would you recommend to a perennial grower that is trying to seed cover crops but does not have the budget for a seeder? Yeah, one one thing uh, depends on what size uh, production they're doing, what acreage they're doing, but. <clears throat> um, you know, the old fashion of, of getting out there and just hand seeding. I know we did that with grains. Uh, we had several acres, and that's a lot of acres to be walking and, and just hand throwing grains. But it can be done, and then you uh, then you come back and lightly uh, disc it in. And we had quite good germination uh, in doing that. But it is time consuming and uh, rather labor cons consuming, uh, but it can be done. Okay. Actually, um, come to think of it, it's if the if the person who asks us does have like a tiller or something, uh, that photograph of that that grower who was tilling in seed, he had taken one of those uh, spin seeders that you just put around, uh, you actually wear it around your middle, and it holds maybe a gallon or two of seed. And you you just hand crank the spinner. He got really really skilled with that, and he got these beautiful even stands of rye and vetch. Yeah. Uh, that's, when he when he filled in use. there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, okay. if you have have the means to work it in shallowly, like with a tiller or something like that, that's uh, a good a good solution. Okay, um, can you suggest a particular cover crop to help success, suppress foxtail? Foxtail. Um, I would say uh, go to a rotation where you're growing a cool season vegetable in the spring or the fall, and then when your foxtail comes on in the summer, any aggressive uh, competitive summer cover crop. And I would include both a broadleaf and a grass. I would go with either, either the pearl millet or the sorghum sedan and then something like cowpea or sun hemp or forage soybean. Or if you're in a really hot climate, you go with lab lab bean or uh, pigeon pea or um, oh, there's another one, old velvet bean. Yeah, a, a number of uh, very competitive uh, summer cover crops can deal with that. And if you're in the far north, I would say perhaps uh, buckwheat might do fairly well if you if you term if you're finished up with your spring vegetable uh, and you till and immediately plant buckwheat it might uh, keep foxtail emergence down I'm not sure about that but uh, it would be worth a try. Okay, yeah, we're just getting a couple questions about the recording. Um, yes, we have been recording this, so if you missed the beginning, we will be putting it up on the eOrganic YouTube channel. Um, someone wanted to know if we would mail you a link, and we may not have time to mail you a link, but if you just Google eOrganic YouTube channel, um, you should find it right there. As soon as we post the recording, it'll be the first video that is visible, um, so you should be able to find it pretty easily. So um, what is the best way to get rid of perennial weeds in a perennial crop? We struggle with nut sedge in field-grown perennial flowers. Digging our product spreads the tubers horribly, but we're unable to eradicate it by the time we need to harvest. Mm, that's a good question. Another, another research question. Uh, probably you would have to rotate out um, for a while uh, you might just have to take uh, sections that are most heavily infested out of production and just use a combination of uh, repeated tillage and aggressive cover crops uh, until you've gotten the nut sedge out. Uh, if it's yellow nut sedge, one thing to be aware of is that improving soil drainage will give your crop the edge over the weeds. And for both nut sedges, um, if you're uh, growing flowers that are in a family that does uh, associate with mycorrhizal fungi, um, providing inoculum might give the crop a bit of an edge over it. But if you have a heavy infestation, uh, it might well be that you'll have to take sections out of production and um, just do battle with the nut sedge until it's under control. Okay. Um is there any innovative strategy to kill horsetail weed and or mare's tail weed, and are they the same thing? Horsetail. Uh, is this a primitive plant that's um, 
uh, looks almost like a club moss, or are you talking about the um, – is it a, a plant that's in the uh, daisy family and makes uh, uh, small uh, flower heads a little like a thistle? Because horse weed is is one common weed that's a um, tends to be a winter annual, or spring annual. Oh, he's talking about the equisatum. So the equisatum, okay, plant. that's yeah. different. Mm -hmm. mm. I've not had experience with that one. Okay. If anyone else wants to chip in, um, feel free to type that into the Q and A there, and I'll try to read out the com comment and may want to reference that you're talking about that weed. Um, mm. Okay. Um, in the meantime, you mentioned the reliance of soil micro. Oh, I guess, okay, you mentioned soil microbes to control weeds. What type or species in general are considered as weed controlling, and if known, what are the general modes of action? Well, I don't really know of any soil microbes that would be a weed control. Uh, mainly, um, I think what I, as far as I can tell, uh, when you have a very healthy soil and you have beneficial microbes that support uh, vigorous crop growth, it just contributes to the crops having the advantage over the weeds. Uh, it doesn't directly, if you have microbes that will directly attack the weeds, there is a risk that they will directly attack some of the crops in your rotation as well. Uh, there are a few cases of um, biological weed controls that are under uh, research and development that do involve a specific pathogen. Uh, but, for example, if you have a weed that's in the mustard family, you don't really want to use it if you've got a lot of brassicas in your rotation. Uh, and the same with the grass family, which is a very common uh, family for weeds. You know, if you've got corn and wheat in your production plants, um, then a, a microbe that's going to attack grass weeds might uh, hurt your crops, too. But mycorrhizal fungi, the interesting thing about them is that a lot of our crops are strongly mycorrhizal. Um, they, they, they benefit from the interaction, from the presence of mycorrhizae in the root systems, whereas uh, a lot of the weeds, including the nuts, hedges, the pig weeds, the smart weeds, lamb's quarters, um, and even some of the weedy grasses are non-mycorrhizal. And in some cases, uh, it means that the mycorrhizae will actually grow into the roots, but instead of being a beneficial um, organism to that weed. It's like a very mild parasite. In fact, there was one study in India that showed um, in a uh, pot, basic something like a pot culture where, you, where you're just doing like experiments in large um, uh, flower pots, that when you plant onions, which are strongly mycorrhizal with purple nutsedge, which is a very aggressive weed, but is non-mycorrhizal, they actually showed that it will that the presence of a of an inoculum mycorrhizae will strengthen the onion and weaken the nutsedge to some extent. Uh, so that was an interesting finding. Hmm. Okay. But this is um, not it's not a weed control, but it's like one of those steps you can take to improve uh, crop vigor through overall soil health and soil biology management. And I think the whole food, soil food web is involved. It's not just that one group of fungi, although that's an important component. Okay, when um, transitioning between conventional to sustainable weed management, my experience is the first thing that will come up after Roundup are weeds. Do you also see this? First thing know. that comes up after Roundup is, is which kind of weeds or just weeds in it's general? Just weeds in general. Uh, that transition period, oh, I meant to address that. One of the, one really excellent strategy for the transition period, if you can afford to do this if you have enough land area to take the transitioning field out of production and or out of annual crop production and put it in some kind of a perennial forage, which, you know, it could be alfalfa or clover grass, you know, harvest it for hay or rotationally graze it. Uh, but when it's in that perennial forage after a period of conventional row crop production or conventional vegetables, it will uh, help reduce the weeds, and at the same time, it tremendously benefits soil health. When you're coming out of conventional production, you don't have the soil life and the soil organic matter that you would in what we would call a mature organic field, one that's been under organic management for a number of years. So um, 
And when you go cold turkey off of herbicides, which you have to do at the beginning of the transition period in order to be able to, to uh, certify organic three years later, uh, you have removed the one tool of weed management that has been used regularly on that field so that you will naturally get a bounce back of a lot of weeds, particularly ones uh, that may have been suppressed through the previous production system, but, have, but there's still a seed bank present in the soil. Um, so it's just a matter of building the soil and, you know, a series, either a series of cover crops and uh, strategic tillage or going into that perennial rotation. Okay. Um, let's see. This person knows someone setting up new berry fields, aronia and blueberry. And um, so on what scale will the zipper tarp mulch be cost effective and manageable? One acre, 10 acres, or even 100 acres? Uh, I do not have the... Um, answer to that question. Uh, I would certainly think that at, at several acres it would certainly be uh, feasible. You don't have to cover the entire field; just the rows, you know, like two feet on either side of your of your row of your of your newly established uh, crop. Uh, and you could maintain the the spaces. You know, you can maintain the alleys in a in a mowed sod. Okay, um, we have a couple questions about herbicides. Um, is the use of the alternative herbicide ammonium nano oh, see, wait, hold on. Ammonium nonanoate um or soap fatty acid permitted in certified organic agriculture in the US? And if so, how effective is it? Are you familiar with that? Um I do know that uh there are some ammonium salts of fatty acids and uh I would refer uh I would refer, refer the person to the NOP standards or the Organic Materials Review Institute, OMRI. Um, the product should indicate either OMRI approved or NOP allowed uh, on it if it is indeed allowed. The other one is just to ask your certifier. But I'm pretty sure that there are at least some of those formulations, the ammonium soaps, the fatty acids, uh, that um, are permitted. And efficacy, all of these have some, you know, burn down, uh, quick acting herbicide effect. Uh, none of them is going to be systemic the way uh, Roundup is. And so none of them will, will probably be that effective as a standalone strategy. You would need to uh, use it in conjunction with other organic uh, weed management practices, including those that build soil health. Okay. Um, what's the best way to control weeds that are spread by rhizomes? Well, actually, I, I, I think I didn't, I, I may have not emphasized that enough. Um, what you do is go ahead and till it up. I mean, say if you have an area that, that you, you're between crops and you know you've got one of these rhizomatous weeds, go ahead and till it up, you know, and then let the weeds come up. You're going to have a million of them coming up. But let them get three leaves on. Each little shoot has three leaves. It's, it's expended some of its underground reserves to make those three leaves. Then hit it again, and you can hit it pretty shallow. You don't have to, you know, mold or plow the whole field or really churn up the soil real hard, but just enough to sever off and undercut that new growth. And depending upon how bad your infestation is, you might need to do that a couple of times. And then immediately plant the most aggressive in-season cover crop that you can come up with. So like if it's um, late spring, it might be a combination of buckwheat and sorghum sedan grass to cover the ground quickly and then um, uh, get a very competitive stand uh, there. Or if it's into the fall, you might want to go with like rye and uh, Austrian peas or something like that that's going to um, occupy the niche really thoroughly. Um, tillage radish is also excellent weed suppressor because it, very, it makes a very dense shading canopy and it's fast growing. Uh, but that trick, uh, that, that three-leaf uh, stage, that's the point that you can really set these uh, plants back. By the time they've got five or six leaves, they're starting to rebuild their underground reserves. Okay, I think we have time for one final question here. Um, according to your knowledge, how, danger, how dangerous is lesser celandine or, oh, let's see, yeah, Ficaria vernal, or Ficaria vernal? I'm sorry. Let's see. Lesser celandine is the question. Ficaria verna, F-I-C-A-R-I-A-V-E-R-N-A. -A -A -E um, you might want. Oh, I'm not familiar with okay. that. Okay. Is, is it a weed? Is it a weed or what is it? Um, if the questioner might want to just type that in 
a little more detail here. Yeah. What about a little more detail on the question? Okay, we'll give them another few minutes <laughs> or another. Uh -huh. another so, let's see. Um, okay, I hope he's still here. Okay, it's a weed that propagates through bulbs. So hmm. maybe the last question might have been helpful, but. Um, yeah, okay. well, um, it's not a weed I'm familiar with, so. Okay. All right. Are you familiar with it, Diana? No, not at all. Sorry. Okay, well, um, thank you so much, everyone, for all the great questions. And um, as I mentioned, you will be able to find the recording in about a week on the eOrganic YouTube channel. And we would be very grateful if you could fill out our follow-up email survey, which will be arriving today along with a copy of the slide handout. So thank you again, Diana and Mark. And we look forward to having you at our next webinar which I believe is in September. If you go to the link on your screen and you, um, the first one that's on the screen there, you can find the entire e organic webinar schedule. All you have to do is type into a search engine e organic, you can find them all there. And um, then you can register for the entire set of webinars in this series. So thanks everyone for joining us.